with tresses oh Lord <laughs> All right, good evening. good evening. Good to see everybody tonight. Everybody blessed? Yeah. Blessed, everybody doing well? Good. Those of you that joined us online, we're so glad to have you tonight as well. Uh, excited to be back, enjoyed the time off. I hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, and, but we are excited to be back in Ezra again tonight. So um, I'm going to go ahead and open us up in a word of prayer, and then I'm going to ask Miss Vicky to come and, and lead us, and we will worship through song. And, ma'am, don't have any, but we can handle that in just a moment. But let's pray, let's pray, and then, then we'll take care of that, okay? Father, we come to you right now, and we thank you so much for all the blessings that you give. God, we are just, just a blessed people. Father, to know you as our Lord and Savior, that you wake us up in the morning and you uh, allow us to be able to be here. Father, we're so thankful. We're thankful that we can join back together, Father, in worshiping you. Father, tonight as we spend this time together worshiping and, and always, we pray, God, that you would just bless us, but that you would receive the worship of a sweet aroma. Father, we ask it in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. All right. All right, all right. We'll get some books. If you're watching at home, we got to get some books. It's all good. All right. Take those to your table. I think about one or two more is about all we need. All right, thank you. Do what? Oh, yeah, when I sing, yeah, I, I don't do that. Hey, Greg, I got the books right here. Greg, Greg we got books. I got the books right here. Uh, I, can't, I can't use one of them at the back. All right. All right, back mic'd up again, all good. All right, so we are in, what book are we in tonight? Ezra. The book of Ezra. What chapter is it we're going to be in? Four, five, six, seven, how many, who, how many, how many says five? One. How many says six? Y'all would be right. Chapter six. 
All right. I am, you are, hey, you are A-OK if you read them all. So that's good. So I am in, we are in chapter 6 tonight. And um, if you recall a couple weeks ago as we closed out, what had happened is as they were uh, trying to rebuild uh, the temple, the prophets had uh, kind of chastised them and, and got them back to building. And then along came the, the local mayor, uh, so to speak. And he came along and said, hey, who told y'all you could start building again? And uh, when they went on and, and told him that it was, uh, that they were, had been given a decree to do that, he uh, decided that here's what he was going to do. He was going to send a letter to the king, and he was going to ask the king to search the treasure house and see if he could find a decree that had been issued by King Cyrus. And um, so take a look at it in this matter. Now we... We wonder why the mayor decided to do that. He could have very easily just said, no, uh, you can't build. You've been told before, don't build. He could have stopped them. He could have said no. But instead of saying no, he allowed them to continue to build. And he said, while you're doing that, I'm going to send a letter and get to the bottom of this. Well, that was good news because while they were waiting on the letter, because remember, he couldn't send an email. He couldn't send the Pony Express. It was going to take a while for the letter to get to the king. And then when it got to the king, if the king chose to do a search for the records, that was going to take a while too because they couldn't Google it, right? They, they couldn't find it that far. They had to actually go physically to the historical records and go through the treasure house to try to find the records. And so all the while that this was going on, if, if the king agreed to that, it would be good news because they could continue to build all during that time. As uh, we left it, he had sent the letter to King Darius to ask about uh, whether he would search or not. And so we're going to pick up in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 6. It says, Then King Darius issued a decree, and a search was made in the archives, where the treasures were stored in Babylon. And at Akmetha, in the palace that is in the province of Media, a scroll was found, and in it a record was written thus. Now we're going to stop there for a moment because there's a few things that I want us to understand here. First of all, King Darius did not have to search for that decree at all. King Darius could have said, nope, tell him stop building, that's that. Didn't have to call for the records to be searched for. But as God would have it, he put it on King Darius to search for the records. Now, here's the amazing thing. Remember, they were searching for the records in the treasure house at Babylon. But that's not where the records were found. They didn't find the records in the treasure house at Babylon. They found the records at another location. They found the records at Akmetha, right? So they found the records at this other location. Well, this other location means that they had to do even more searching than to just find the records in Babylon. So he went, they went through the treasure house in Babylon looking for this, and they didn't find anything. But instead of stopping and saying, well, we didn't find anything, so there obviously it doesn't exist, and so y'all got to stop building, and, and we're going to tear all this down, they continued to search. And so they went to another location that also housed records, but it was far enough before that, it, it was kind of like, you know, how you archive your oldest things, you move to make space for the new things. That's kind of what they did. They moved the older things to this other location to make space for new records because it had been quite a while since this decree was made. So they go to this other location to look for the records, and a scroll was found. So the thing to, to see is obviously God was involved in this whole process. Because why would they have concerned themselves so deeply that they would have gone even out of Babylon into another location looking to thoroughly search and make sure that the record did not exist when it wasn't necessarily in their benefit to find it or not? Now think about this. The king very easily could have taken the word of um, the, the, basically it was the mayor. He could have taken the word of, of him and said, you know, they're building a fortress. They're trying to, to rebel. That's what they're doing. He could have taken that word and he could have just said, well, we searched for some records. We didn't find any. That's that. So go back and tell them to stop and tear down what they've done. 
Um, but that's not what he did. Uh, Tatanai was the, the one that was sending that message. He didn't do that. He didn't stop there. So obviously God had placed it on Darius' heart to make a thorough search until he went to, they sent people to a second location and there they found the scrolls. So it's, it's very amazing. And, and the, the fact, the good news was that while the search began um, in Babylon, the records were found somewhere else. During all the time that this search was going on, it gave the builders extra time to keep building. So they were keep on keeping on. You know, it's kind of like if we build it enough, they're going to just say, well, you got that close, go ahead and finish it, you know. Um, or maybe we'll get it done before they make a decision. And then it's harder to, to do away with it, right? That's why uh, even today people will start building things while they're waiting on a permit uh, so that hopefully by the time they make a decision, they'll say, well, it's already half built. We might as well give them the permit. You know, it's kind of the way that was going. They were continuing to build. God gave them that extra time to build. So in all of this that we see, they finally found this record, and they found it on a scroll um, and Persian official scrolls wrote on scrolls of papyrus and leather. And they found this scroll in just that way. So we move on from chapter, I mean, from verse 1 and 2, move in to verses 3 through 5. Verse 3 through 5, it says, In the first year of King Cyrus, King Cyrus issued a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be rebuilt the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations of it be firmly laid. Its height 60 cubits, its width 60 cubits, with three rows of heavy stones and one row of new timber. Let the expense be paid from the king's treasury. Also let the gold and silver articles of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took from the temple, which is in Jerusalem, and be brought to Babylon, be restored and taken back to the temple which is in Jerusalem, each to its place and deposit them in the house of God. So there's several things here that um, King Cyrus had put in this decree and it answered some amazing things. Um, this decree that we're reading right now is the very same decree that was in Ezra chapter one, okay? So that was the very same decree. It's now being found by King Darius. It was decreed by King Cyrus. There had been several kings since that time, but the decree was never overridden. It still stood. Um, and we see several things. One, not only did he give permission for the temple to be built, but he also said it was going to be paid for by the royal treasury. He not only told them to go back and build it, but go back and build it and we'll pay for it out of the royal treasury. So again, as the Israelites were beginning the rebuilding and they were continuing now to build on this. They were doing what they were commissioned to do in the first place and the funding was to come from the royal treasury. Now, because of the other kings coming in and the things that had happened, what we find is that they were continuing the build but they weren't getting the um, they weren't getting the money from the kingdom as they previously had been. It wasn't being given to them. So what they were building, they were building out of what they had. They didn't get the, the funding from the kingdom to continue building when they restarted this process. Now, when this decree is reread, uh, they find that not only was the decree to build it, but also to pay for it. So it's, it's a, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> we're supposed to have been paying for this all along. So they go back and they read that decree. But not only was it the fact that they were supposed to build it, not only was it the fact that it was supposed to be funded by the royal treasury, but it even said in the decree how they were supposed to build it. Now remember, this is not a Jew that is making this decree. This is a non-Jew king that is making this decree, King Cyrus. And when he made this decree, not only did he tell him to build it, not only did he say, we're going to pay for it, but then he turned around and said that how it should be laid, he gave... Um, he said it should let the foundations of it be firmly laid and its height 60 cubits, its width 60 cubits. But he also said, let the house be rebuilt in the place where they offered sacrifices. <coughs> in other words, go rebuild it on the same foundation where it was. Don't rebuild it anywhere else. Build it where it was. And 
this is a, a size that he gave. And then not only did he give the size, but he said with three rows of heavy stones. Remember last time we looked, one of the things that um, uh, Tatius was uh, upset about, one of the things that he was worried about was that they were building it with these large stones and reinforcing it with timber. And, and that was one of the things he was saying. This is being built more like a fortress and not like a temple. And so when, we, when he was saying that and we're looking at all that, uh, Tatanai said, um, listen, this is not being built like what we would think of as a temple. This looks like it's being built as a fortress. But when Darius pulled the records and read what Cyrus had wrote, Cyrus said build it with three rows of large stones and reinforce it with timber, which is exactly what the people were doing. So now they've not only found that, yes, they were supposed to build it, it was supposed to be funded by the, temp, by the, um, the kingdom, and on top of that, they were supposed to build it with the large stones and the timber exactly like they were doing. Now, there's a little bit of question about the size listed here. Because if you look at the size that's listed here with its height 60 cubits and its width 60 cubits, um, that's even bigger than Solomon's temple. So that's even bigger than what Solomon's temple was. So um, there's a little question about that. And so what most theologians believe is that Cyrus wasn't saying you need to build it to exactly this size. He said you need to build it on the foundations. And he gave the size. That was the maximum. You couldn't extend past that. In other words, don't go past this. This is what you have. This is how much room you have to work with. Now go back and build it on its foundations, which wouldn't be quite that large, but it would be contained within that. So that's what most theologians believe when we look at the size, and it seems different because it's even bigger than what Solomon's temple was. He wasn't commanding the temple to be built to that size. He was giving them that much area to build it within. Okay, So in case you happened to look that up and said, hey, that seems bigger than, now you know, okay? Um, so that's what most theologians believe is that it was just given an area that they could build it in because it wasn't, obviously, it wasn't going to be bigger than Solomon's temple. But it was also an amazing thing because not only did they find that the temple was supposed to be rebuilt, it was supposed to be paid for by the king's treasury, um, it was supposed to be built with the large stones and the reinforced timber on the foundations that was already there. But they also found out by reading the decree, not only was it supposed to be built, but all the articles of gold and silver that were taken out of the temple in the first place were supposed to be returned. All of those original items that were taken from the temple were supposed to be given back. Now, you know, most kings are not in the habit of giving back their treasures. But uh, King Cyrus obviously driven by God, told the people that this was what was supposed to happen. So now what started as an effort to stop the building of the temple has revealed the original decree, and now they find out not only are they not going to stop it, but in fact, <laughs> they're going to have to help. Watch how they're going to have to help. So they're not only going to stop it, but they're going to have to help. Look at verse 6 through 12. It says here, Now therefore... Tatanai, governor of the region beyond the river, and um, Shethnar, Bonzai, uh, Bonzai, and your companions, the Persians who are beyond the river, keep yourselves far from there. In other words, don't you be messing with them. Let the work of the house of God alone, let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God on its site. Moreover, I issue a decree as to what you shall do for the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God, let the cost be paid out of the king's expense from taxes on the region beyond the river. That's where Tatanai was, okay? That's where all of them were. So the taxes that they were supposed to be paying to the king, now they got to give that money to the Jews for, to help rebuild the temple. So not only were they not going to stop it, now they had to help by giving money. They had to help and give the money to the Jews as they did that so from the taxes from the region beyond the river this is to be given immediately to these men so that they are not hindered and whatever they need young bulls rams lambs for the burnt offerings of the god of heaven wheat salt wine and oil according to the request of the priests who are in jerusalem let it be given to them day by day without fail 
that they may offer sacrifices of sweet aroma to the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. Also, I issue a decree that whoever alters this edict, now listen to this, let a timber be pulled from his house and erected and let him be hanged on it and let his house be made a refuse heap because of this. And may the God who causes his name to dwell there destroy any king or people who put their hand to alter it or to destroy this house of God which is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, issue a decree, let it be done diligently. So when Darius found this and he read it, he not only said, well, yeah, they have the approval to build it. He added to it and said, yes, you go back and stay away from them. You let them build it. And all the money that you're supposed to be paying in taxes to the king, you give them the money so they have everything they need. Not only that, you give them all the livestock and all of the produce, everything they need for their sacrifices. You give them all of that so that they can do it. Now, what Darius did recognize is what the elders of the Jews recognized. It was essential to build the temple on the original foundation. He knew that, and he said that's the way it will be. But he also commanded that it be funded by those on that side of the river. Listen, you're going to not only uh, not stop them, you're going to pay for it. And then he put the, the burden on of paying for it directly on the people that were there, the ones that were in that province. Now, here's the other thing. What, what's crazy is he said, whatever they need, give it to them. If they need it, give it to them. Don't you hold anything back. Every, if they come to you every day needing something, you give them whatever they need to build the temple. So the, the, the whole thing is the work of God was going to be furthered and not hindered, right? So what started out as a plan to stop the building of the temple because, hey, this looks like they're building something that's going to be a fortress and they may try to, to break away from the kingdom and have their own thing. We want to stop that. Now it's turned into, oh, now we're going to help them build it and give them everything they need. Now, the, the amazing thing to me was in reading this passage that he not only said give them the money so that they can buy all the materials and do everything they need, but he also said give them the animals. Give them the bulls, the rams, the lambs for the burnt offering. Give them the wheat, the salt, the wine, and the oil. Give it all to the priest and let it be given to them every day so they may offer sacrifices every day and that they might pray. But look. Notice why he wanted them to pray. He said, let them pray. And he said, let me find it again. Um, let them pray for the life of the king and his sons. Now listen, Darius wasn't a believer, so to speak. But Darius understood from reading what Cyrus had put and looking through the history records and knowing what was happening, he understood that this God that they were praying to was powerful. And even if he didn't believe in that God in particular, he wanted them to have success. He wanted them praying to their God. And oh yeah, I'm giving you everything you need and doing all of it. So when you go pray, pray for me and my sons too. Pray for us. We're giving you everything now. Pray for us. So he kind of had a a personal motive in making sure this was done because he wanted them to pray for him and his sons, which they did, by the way. They did pray for the king and his sons. And so that's one of the motives that he had in helping them to get this temple rebuilt. Now, what we really know is it was the hand of God. God's the one that directed that. God directed the king Cyrus to make the decree in the first place. He directed King Darius to reissue the decree and to continue to push to make sure that the temple was built. Now, there's a little bit of debate about the punishment. Anybody who hindered it said they're going to take a timber out of the house, right? And, and what were they going to do? They're going to remove a timber from the house. And it says, um, um, let's see exactly how it says it. Yeah, it says, let a timber be pulled from the house and erect it and let him be hanged on it. Now, listen to me. There's a little bit of confusion and, and some, you know, trying to decide. But so here is something that Darius did to 3,000 Babylonians when he took Babylon. He took a timber and he impaled them on the timber from the bottom to the top till it came out their neck and he hung them on it up in the air. So what he's saying here is if anybody stops this building, 
take a timber out of the house and impale them on this timber and hang them above this house so that the entire house will be considered a refuse heap. He wasn't giving them no hand slap. They was getting some serious trouble. If they hindered anybody, he gave that decree. And listen, the people that were part of that kingdom knew very well that over 3,000 Babylonians he did that to when he took Babylon. Yes, sir. He, they, they determined, I better do what he says because I don't want to end up on that stick like that. Um, so when he gave the decree, he was, he was deadly serious to make sure that the people understood that this brutal man, these executions that he had done in, in all of this, that he had done even to these 3,000 Babylonians, that he would definitely have that done to anyone whom he had told not to, to not mess with them. If you stop them, that's what's going to happen. So that's a pretty amazing thing. So think about this. Uh, think about uh, Tatanai when he received that response back from the king. Now remember, he wasn't talking to him on the telephone. <laughs> he didn't call him up and tell him all this. They had to send a letter back. So there had been many months had passed from the time the first letter was sent to the time the letter came back. And now Tatanai is reading this letter, and can't you see his eyes just getting bigger by the moment as he's reading everything that this king has said? And, and the last part of that letter is, anybody that stops them, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. Now, if that's, I'm him, first thing I'm going to do is run down there and say, y'all doing a good job. Do you need some help? Here, let me give you some money to help build this thing. Oh, yeah, you need any, anything you need, you let me know. I'm going to make sure you get it. Uh, I'm going to make sure you do a good job. So a lot of surprise when, when he would read that. But absolutely, he would not... He would not stop it. Now, the whole thing is, we think about the king, right? Look over with me to Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1. Proverbs 21 and verse 1. I want you to see something here. Proverbs. 21 and verse 1. Proverbs 21 and verse 1 says, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. Think about that. The king, that's the king now. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And he, like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes it to go. That doesn't say that kings that know him follow him it says the king's heart is in his hand and he turns that king wherever he wants him to go so even kings that don't know him that don't call him lord kings that are against him he still has them in his hand and he turns them whichever way he chooses for them to go so he makes that that happen he made that happen with king cyrus and he followed it up with king darius and so in all of that that was done it was done because of God's will. Now, look with me to verses 13 through 15. Verses 13 through 15. It says, Then Tatanai, governor of the region beyond the river, uh, Shethnar, Bonsnai, and their companions diligently did according to what King Darius had sent. So the elders of the Jews built, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo, and they built and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was the sixth year in the reign of King Darius. So the temple was finished, it says. Not only did they give them the... the uh, the deal to work not only did they give them all the things that they need but they also finished it now one of the things i want you to see is there could have been uh, from a king's perspective there could have been some political motivation in all of that um, because um, in all of the what they were doing it would promote stability in the empire against egypt okay so you know, there's always other reasons that things can be done, and God uses those things. Um, 
the temple, they prospered through the, the prophets. Now, those prophets that they're talking about are the very same prophets that told them to get off their behinds and get busy building that thing again, right? That's the same prophets that came and said, y'all want to say, not now, but soon. No, now, get up and start building. And they got up and started building. The very same prophets continued to prophesy. They continued to um, encourage them as they worked. They continued to show how God was blessing them. And through all of that, they absolutely prospered. Um, the temple was finished the third day of the month of Adar, which is the sixth year. This means it took four years from the resumption of construction. And it was such a, a big job that even with everybody working diligently, it wasn't quickly completed, right? It took four more years after they started working on it again, um, which isn't surprising. You think about what it talked about with the, the three layers of large stones and timbers and and listen, they did not, they couldn't call Sunbelt Rentals and get a, a, you know, a crane down there. Um, they couldn't get all, that was all by hand. So they had to do all of that by hand. So it took them four years, even working diligently to get it done. Now, the amazing thing is the mention of King Artaxerxes right at the end of that actually is in the next century. King Artaxerxes is a future king, but it talks about him already in this passage. So look with me to 16 through 18, because now they have finished the, the building it, um, and it was in the sixth year of King Darius. So they finished building it, and then in 16 it says, Then the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the descendants of the captivity celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. They offered sacrifices at the dedication of this house of God, 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats according to the number of the tribes of Israel. They assigned the priests to their divisions and the Levites to their divisions over the service of God in Jerusalem as it is written in the book of Moses. Okay, So they finished the temple. They had the, the dedication service. They're doing all of that. And one of the things that uh, we remember is there was a big celebration before when they built the altar, right? When they got the altar completed, there was a big celebration. They heard it all over the place. Well, now they're having this big celebration, but this is um, when they when they finished the, the, the altar and they laid the foundations when they began, and now this is actually finishing this second temple, so it's a celebration of that. <coughs> now, that was a lot of livestock. We look at that, we look at all that they offered to the sacrifices, 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and plus another 12 um, male goats. So that was a lot of livestock that they offered sacrifices for. But I want you to listen to this. I want you to compare it to the sacrifices made at the completion of the first temple. When King Solomon built the temple. When King Solomon built the first temple, there was, there was a, a little bit larger sacrifice. Solomon sacrificed 142,000 animals. 142,000 animals at the dedication of the temple. At the second dedication, there was a total of 712. So, big difference. Well, part of the big difference is the wealth of Israel was much less <laughs> during that time than it was when Solomon was in charge. <coughs> yeah, at Solomon, Solomon, there was a lot of wealth. But at this point, they had just coming back out of Babylon. The only ones that were left in Jerusalem were the very poor. And they, they were not doing anything. They, they couldn't do anything to increase their wealth. So they were very poor. And even the ones that were outside of the Israelites that provided the animals, they on that side of the river did not have the wealth that they had in Babylon because they were taking it all to Babylon. So 712 animals seems like an awful lot, and it is, but it was not near the amount of what King Solomon did. But, you know, King Solomon did everything big. Everything King Solomon did was big. Um, you know, he, he did everything big. Um, so it was a little bit smaller, but, you know, some, some might say that uh, kind of the difference in um, what those who had plenty gave versus the widows might, uh, that God was more pleased with what the widow gave than, what, than those who had more. Some might say that God was more pleased with the second sacrifice of the temple than he was at the first because they didn't have very much, but they still gave a large amount. So, they gave what they had, and it was something that God was pleased in. We know that for certain. So, amazing thing. 
So <clears throat> in all of this, the other thing is to understand they gave this sin offering for all 12 tribes of Israel. They didn't give it for only part of the tribes of Israel. They gave 12 male goats, and it was all 12 tribes of Israel. There wasn't any lost tribes. They were all 12. That's what they gave it for. And they assigned the priest the same as it was written in the book of Moses, and then also um, according to the previous pattern that David had established, because David established slightly differently than uh, the book of Moses. And so they established those priests in the same divisions and set them up again so that they would serve at the temple and regular sacrifices and service, everything would be done according to the law the way it was supposed to be done. So what an amazing thing to think about that for all those years, for 70 years, they've been in captivity. They finally returned from captivity and everything's in ruins. Now it's taken them quite a while from that time to get back and rebuild. They've got the temple rebuilt. They've got the... Um, the altar rebuilt, they're now back to sacrificing, they're putting priests in charge, they're doing all of the things that they need to do in order to make sure that they continue uh, to go in the right direction. So an amazing thing as we see that. Now, <clears throat> when we look at the very end of chapter 6, we see, And the descendants of the captivity kept the Passover on the 14th day <coughs> pardon me, of the first month, for the priests and the Levites had purified themselves. All of them were ritually clean, and they slaughtered the Passover lambs for all the descendants of the captivity, for their brethren, brethren the priests, and for themselves. <coughs> Pardon me. Then the children of Israel had returned from the captivity, ate together with all who had separated themselves from the filth of the nations of the land in order to seek the Lord God of Israel. And they kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy, for the Lord made them joyful, and they turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. So, in all of this that they did, everything that they did, they continued to serve God, they continued to um, keep the Passover, they continued to do all of those things, and the Lord made them joyful. So, what an amazing thing. The, the last thing I want to tell you, this, the, it says that they had turned the heart of the king of Assyria. That was a title for Darius, um, and, and it speaks of, of um, all the authenticity. How did they turn the heart of the king of Assyria? They prayed for him. They prayed for him every day. They prayed for him and his sons, just like he decreed for that to be done. And it turned the heart of the king. So... It's an amazing thing. Now, I want to end this by saying this. Pray for your president and all of those in leadership of our country daily. Because if God can take a person like Darius that was so brutal and did the things that he did to gain power and turn his heart, he can certainly turn the leader of our country the way it needs to be. So pray for your president and all those leaders every day so we will pick up next week um back in uh, chapter seven. seven we'll pick up in chapter seven tonight go ahead and get out your prayer request sheets